Thank you so much. And it's really great to be here in a room with so much concentrated wisdom. And um, I thank you and thank Mary Ann for founding this wonderful society. And thank Joe Handelsman, who is not able to be with us today. Um, and really everyone who is united here for the same idea of supporting women in science. Um, we, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our foundation and what we've done over the years. We started the foundation in 93, but we didn't develop our prize program until the year 2000. Please feel free to ask questions at the end. I'm just going to give you a quick thumbnail um, of a little story of my husband, kind of how we also came to do what we're doing. So today is really from a perspective of a donor um, in this philanthropic work. It is an enormous pleasure to be honored by the Rosalind Franklin Society and to feel in partnership with so many of you here. Um, I'm Patricia Gruber, and I'm a co-founder of our foundation, along with my husband, Peter Gruber. Um, and we have had the honor and still have the honor of honoring and celebrating outstanding individuals with prizes in cosmology, neuroscience, and genetics. And today we'll tell you what, a little bit about what it's like to be a donor. This past year has been a year of transition for our foundation. We have moved our foundation to Yale University. And after 11 years as president, I'm now president emeritus. And uh, this is for an exciting reason. We have fulfilled a long-held wish to transition our prizes, um, to have the prizes go on beyond us. So to do this while we're still alive um, is to let go of a bunch of things, but also to do that for the benefit of science going forward. So we made a succession plan, which under my direction was um, finalized at Yale so that our three science prizes will go on in perpetuity or as close to that as anyone ever gets. Um, and what that means is that we gave Yale a big endowment so that they could um, ensure the continuity of the prize program for a long time. And it's called the Gruber Foundation. It was the Peter and Patricia Gruber Foundation at Yale. It's called the Gruber Foundation. And my focus going forward will be on policy to make sure that it gets on the right track and continues as we planned. We're delighted that our tradition is going to be continued not only by Yale, but by our very own dedicated executive director who's here with us today, Sarah Rea. It's only common sense that if you think what you're doing is important, that you try to ensure succession. And that means passing the baton to a new generation not only a passage in one's life, but in the life of a successful organization. In this case, from one strong woman to the next. With Sarah's expertise and experience and the strong history of Yale, we're confident about a happy future for these prizes. We have focused on peer recognition at the Gruber Foundation. And we opted from the beginning not to become a household name, but to, be, to have peer recognition. So our goal was to gain respect from experts at the highest levels in the science areas that we focus on, and that includes cosmology, uh, genetics, and neuroscience. And we wanted to recognize and appreciate groundbreaking achievements and for peers to recognize that. So that, like any prize program, they would feel a measure of increased pride, encouragement, and inspiration. We may not be a familiar name to people outside these circles. And many people never heard of us. And we had that experience with some of our early prize winners. We called a prize winner. We were so full of ourselves that we called to give the happy news. And the person hung up on us because they never heard of us. <laughs> so that was our first lesson in peer recognition. A, a, a recipient is going to take a call from a distinguished colleague, not from some well-meaning person. So. We have the chairperson you know, of the committee make the call. So it's not surprising that people would say, what is the Gruber Foundation? We're best known for our annual international prizes that have been given since the year 2000. And currently, we offer three science prizes. 
cosmology, genetics, and neuroscience, and each carries an unrestricted cash award of $500,000 and a gold medal. The prize is open to anyone in the world who has made groundbreaking contributions in science, and we don't accept self-nominations. The prizes are awarded at the professional society meetings associated with each field. So for example, the IAU meeting held in Beijing this year saw the 2012 recipient receive their prize there. And this year at the American Society of Human Genetics meeting in San Francisco. And for neuroscience, it was awarded at the Society for Neuroscience meeting that was held in New Orleans this year. So some of the, over, some of the overview of the recipients of these prizes will probably be f familiar names to you, um, especially in genetics and, and neuroscience. Ron Davis, Gerald Fink, Janet Rowley, Elizabeth Blackburn, a board member, Mary Claire King, David Botstein, Bob Waterston, all these guys, and the next slide. And in cosmology, Wendy Friedman, um, Mark, there are th some, some groups in cosmology more than individuals because of the way astrophysics is done. And next slide. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for this slide of neuroscience recipients. That's okay. And you can just zip zip through. We do neuroscience and then we can zip through the next two after that. It's okay. Yeah, it'd be slide 12. OK. Well, I might just continue the talk, and then we can catch up with the slides so that we won't, we won't get held up. So our neuroscience um, recipients, I'll just mention them quickly. Um, Huda Zogby, um, Robert Wirtz, Jeffrey Hall, Michael Rosbash, and Michael Young received it together for circadian rhythms. And um, John O'Keefe. And Shigatada Nakanishi, Masao Ito, and Roger Nickel, Masakazu Konishi, Eric Knudsen, and then our inaugural recipient was Seymour Benzer. Um, we gave prizes in justice and women's rights as well. Um, and the justice and women's rights laureates um, are outstanding as well, leaders in the field of justice and women's rights, justice in the sense of going beyond simply doing a good job, but taking risks in standing up for principles of rule of law in the world um, um, against forces that would have collapsed, uh, things that organize civil society. And the same for women's rights, advocates of rights of women in everywhere in the world, um, such as uh, the right to own property, um, the right to have custody of your children, um, the right to vote, and so forth. So um, those have become programs and part of the mission at Yale Law School rather than prizes. Five sets of Gruber recipients went on to receive Nobel Prizes. And um, in the slide of the Gruber laureates with Nobels, um, John Mather uh, for cosmology received uh, the cosmology prize and went on to get the Nobel that same year, Elizabeth Blackburn, Bob Horvitz was an early uh, Nobel Prize recipient after getting our genetics prize. 
And uh, Lema Bowie, um, who was a Women's Rights Prize recipient, went on to get the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, in cosmology, two teams uh, won the, cosmo the 2007 recipients of the Cosmology Prize went on to get the Nobel Prize uh, last year in cosmology. So we're pleased about that because in, in our thought, we followed the Nobel model, but we wanted to give prizes in areas that were not already awarded by Nobel. So our mission, um, as, as stated, is that we honor and encourage excellence in the fields of cosmology, genetics, neuroscience, justice and women's rights, recognizing groundbreaking work that provides new models that inspire and enable fundamental shifts in knowledge and culture. And so going forward at Yale, the three areas are the three science areas that are going to go forward, and the other two will be preserved simply as missions. So I'll tell you a little bit about my husband, Peter. Some of you may know Peter's story. Um, but Peter is, along with me, a co-founder and a driving force and have been a, and a major influence in establishing this foundation and creating the foundation. He's had a fascinating life and background. It was really Peter's success in the financial world that made it possible for us to do this philanthropy. His, his success is what gave us the spark and provided actually what is a wonderful problem, and that is you know, what to do with more money than you, than you need. Um, so that's really where we were in 1993, thinking about you know, that problem. What would you do um, if you wanted to try to do something you know, good with money? Um, it wasn't until 2000 that we came up with the prize areas. And someone asked us you know, how we came up with it. It was like, as I said, <laughs> Peter rubbing the foam off the shower door and saying, how about? <laughs> And uh, we went through a, a lot of different subjects. And we, and we wound up really feeling like science really is what makes major contributions. But unless you have rule of law and the participation of women, you, you can't make anything work. So we felt like those two things are fundamental. It creates the environment for the possibility of doing things. And science is then what really helps. So. Um, these are, this is uh, Peter, and we can, you're doing great. So um, Peter is now retired, but he was an international businessman, an intellectual, a reflective and thoughtful man, a husband and a father, and an inspiration to many and help to many across disciplines. In business, he was an SEC registered investment advisor specializing in emerging markets. And he was called a pioneer of emerging markets. He got repeated high ratings for exceptional performance from the leading print indicators in his field, as you can see from Barron's Latin Finance, Institutional Investor, Nelson's Rating Service, and Forbes Magazine, or some. All described him as a, a high-ranking, successful player on the world stage. And his, it was his financial success that has made possible the philanthropy that has given us both so much deep satisfaction. Peter's global perspective came not only from his business experience, which was global, but from his early life as a young Jewish boy from Hungary during the Second World War. At the last moment, the family fled Hungary to India, avoiding the consequences the rest of the family and others experienced at the hand of Adolf Hitler and his troops. When the Japanese began bombing Calcutta, where they had just settled, the parents again feared for their lives. Having just begun to manufacture uniforms for the British Army, the parents decided to stay in Calcutta but to send the kids to safety in the Himalayas, where the British had established good schools. So at a young age, Peter became a global citizen. At nine, having lost his, his native language, which was Hungarian, having said goodbye to toys and friends and pets, having begun to learn English, Hindi, and Urdu, to experience an entirely different culture, complete with a caste system, exotic foods, and a tropical landscape. He then had to leave his parents as well, 
for the hills of the Himalayas along with his two brothers. Of course, even more changes lay ahead. He and his brothers were to be taught not by rabbis, but by Irish Christian brothers and Jesuits. However, they got a terrific education in the hill towns of the Himalayas that for Peter sparked a lifelong curiosity. This kind of journey either makes you collapse and die or it makes you strong. It can make you bitter or something else. Peter developed a beautiful and generous soul capable of wrapping itself around all that suffering with a measure of equanimity. He turned his experiences into an appreciation for diversity and the uniqueness of every individual, a thirst for knowledge, and an early sense of life and death. For a donor, his or her values, life experience, shape the philanthropic entity. So our prizes are international. They're open to anybody from anywhere in the world. They're focused on individual effort. Anybody can make a difference. And they're shaped by the philosophy of an economist. Inspired by Peter, our funding used a capital model to leverage the investment. We've chosen to fund individuals or groups of great promise and excellence. Dollars invested in brilliant research can potentially bring developments that go a great distance toward understanding and curing disease. In conceiving our prize program, we saw the need to invest in individuals whose discoveries, like those that are here today and today's speakers, are likely to contribute the most, to inspire and encourage individuals to make great efforts and serve as examples to others in the field. We also saw a need to follow an economy of scale, to maintain intense focus and use our limited resources wisely in order to achieve these goals. So funding, let's see, we should be moving our slides forward here. Funding the next generation through Young Investigator Awards was also crucial to our vision. So each year, investigators in astronomy, neuroscience, and genetics, and in science in Israel, are funded by the foundation in partnership with the International Astronomical Union, the Society for Neuroscience, the Genetic Society of America and American Society for Human Genetics, and the Weizmann Institute of Science. It is difficult to overstate the contributions these young investigators make. As an example, in astronomy, um, this year's recipient, Lisa Vari from Italy, um, Anna Lisa Vari is focusing her research interests on the structure and internal dynamics of star clusters, with emphasis on internal rotation, external tidal field, weak anisotropy in the velocity space. And in neuroscience, and this is just one example, um, in neuroscience, um, one of our earliest recipients, Astrid Prinz, who was working in Eve Martyr's lab, um, uses a computational method to examine homeostatic regulation in neural circuitry using the stomatogastric ganglion in the lobster as a model. And at the Weizmann Institute, this year's recipient, Dr. Tali Kimchi, asks, what turns sex-related behavior on if brains are wired for both male and female behavior? In her study of pheromones, her lab focuses on elucidation of neuronal mechanisms that govern reproductive behavior patterns. And with the Rosalind Franklin Young Investigator Awards, I'm going to mention a little bit about each of these awardees. Um, Amy Pasquinelli was our first awardee. Um, and Amy and her colleagues showed that an unusual class of regulatory genes, microRNAs, were not restricted to nematodes. See, elegans is her model organism. Since then, hundreds of microRNA genes have been uncovered. MicroRNAs are implicated in diverse biological processes, including regulation of cell death, fat metabolism, and development. By chance, we were invited to the 2006 Nobel Prize. And when we were there, um, we saw Craig Mello and Andy Fire getting their prize. And we, listening to their lecture, who did they cite? Amy Pasquinelli, along with hundreds of others. But still, Amy Pasquinelli, a very young researcher at University of San Diego, has helped define the field of microRNAs. 
Molly Pazorski, her research group, losing comp Using Computational Methods, pursues population genetic approach to investigate the causes and consequences of variation in recombination and dynamics of adaptation. And Iris Hovada, using cross-species approach to identify gene regulatory networks affected by anxiety, her lab studies the genetic and neurobiological basis of anxiety disorders. They aim to understand the molecular mechanisms that lead to and maintain pathological anxiety with a goal of contributing to the development of more efficient targeted therapies. One of today's speakers, Jui Wang or Jade Wang, focuses on how living systems accurately process their genetic information. The fundamental processes of replication, transcription, and processing, known as the central dogma of molecular biology, is conserved from bacterium to human. Her work has revealed major conflicts between transcription and replication. Understanding these interactions contributes significantly to our understanding of survival and disease mechanisms. This year's two recipients, Valerie Horsley and Mary Gehring, um, are, we have pictures of them. Um, the broad interests of the Horsley Lab are to understand tissue organogenesis and homeostasis, which contributes to our understanding of wound healing as well as how that can be a factor in cancer formation. She uses the mouse as a genetic model system. Mary Gehring's lab uses genetic, genomic, and molecular biology approaches to study aspects of epigenomic reprogramming during plant reproduction. Her lab is using the plant Arabidopsis thaliana as a model system with a focus on identifying key regulators of seed development. So these are the young investigators. And from my point of view, as an English major who went on to get a master's degree in psychology and then a postmasters, I was a psychotherapist in private practice before I came to nonprofit management. And with a background that valued service, in the beginning it was not entirely clear to me that managing, running, developing a foundation was in my skill set. But by 2000, it was clear that it was my vocation. Everything I had ever done had prepared me to do this. And what we did is put a human face on nonprofit management, keeping people front and center. We sought out excellence, the best expertise, and we relied on it, learning as we moved forward, with a lot of help along the way. Friends who were senior foundation officials, consultants with knowledge of groundbreaking researchers in each field, and most importantly, strategic alliances with preeminent scientific societies was crucial to maintain the integrity of the science. Retaining expert advisors, valuing them, was important. The expert advisors became the backbone of the prize program. It is they who are largely responsible for the scientific integrity of selection and of the decision making. Peter was busy running his investment business. He didn't want to run a foundation, but we dialogued about everything. Working together, we first collaborated with each other and then expanded our collaboration to include recognized experts in each field, the IAU, ASHG, SFN, GSA, Weizmann Institute, and crucially, um, these pre preeminent science societies played a major role. But the preeminent science societies, the board of trustees, the small staff at the Gruber Foundation, all worked together to make the Gruber Foundation what, what it is today. After deciding on prize areas, we developed all the predictable nomination materials. All of this is online if you want to know any of the administrative specifics. This is an example of the genetics nomination form. We're very fortunate. Often nonprofit organizations spend a lot of time fundraising. We have never had to do that. We're entirely self-funded. So we've been able to spend our time on programs, on choosing advisors, and on our strategic planning. So I'm sure you're curious about how women have fared in the Gruber Prize Program. It's not an entirely happy story, but we've done best with the Young Investigator Awards. So with um, young scientists, we average 52 percent women overall, but in part that's skewed because of the Rosalind Franklin Award, which is only for women. 
So that's not really fair statistically. So taking that out, we average 43 percent women, which is pretty terrific. Um, so if you drill down to each science, cosmology has 50 percent women, young investigators, genetics 100 percent, of course, and neuroscience 42 percent. And that's because of the enlightened attitudes at the preeminent science societies. And also we speak up. We advocate for geographic gender diversity um, very vocally. In our more well-known awards in science, um, the percentages are much lower. And in some ways, they also represent some of the percentages of, of women in the field. Um, these totals are from 2000 to 2011, when we began awarding science prizes. With a total of 44 science prize laureates, there are only six women, for a total of 13.6 percent, pretty dismal. Cosmology has 10 percent women, genetics 25 percent women, neuroscience 8 percent women. And if you look at the distribution across our advisory boards, um, with our focus of supporting women in science when possible, a woman chair is selected for the committee um, in consultation, of course, with the societies and um, the past chair. Fifty-three percent of our chairs have been women. So in cosmology, 50 percent have been women. In genetics, all the chairs have been female. And in neuroscience, 25 percent of the chairs have been women. So in summary, our thoughts in establishing prizes across science and human rights was to aim for excellence, to reward the achievements of individuals, and to shine a spotlight on fields of human endeavor that not only deeply enrich our world, but which have the promise of doing so for at least 50 years. And we felt the affirmation of one's peers is the highest praise. And it was with that in mind that our foundation decided to rely entirely on the opinions of outstanding individuals in the respective fields. We only input on policy. Our wish that equal opportunity for both men and women would be furthered by these awards continues. Realizing that parity does not exist throughout the world, we created a women's rights prize that sought, and we created the Rosalind Franklin Young Investigator Award that sought to redress the glaring omission of Rosalind Franklin and established a Young Investigator Award in her name in 2004. In a small way, the effect of these actions has been to call attention to women. The, United, the American Society of Human Genetics and GSA sent us a letter after the second year of this award telling us that they thought they knew about how many young women there were in the field of genetics and that thanks to our prize, they had no clue. There were over 256 highly qualified applications for the one position, the one Rosalind Franklin Young Investigator Award. And based on that, they persuaded us to offer more than one. So now we offer two awards. Um, and still, I think this is not enough. Um, so there are so many promising young women scientists coming up through the ranks. It's been a heads up for everybody. With Young Scientist Awards, we've been vocal advocates for women. And in addition to the enlightened attitudes of the societies with which we work, this has helped. Most years, we see both a man and a woman receive Young Investigator Awards, or in alternating years. We speak up when we notice that women are left out. So thank you for your attention. And it's a real privilege, again, to be here. And we'll appreciate any ideas you have. You can write us at info at Gruber Prizes. We will especially appreciate your nominations for any of the science prizes. All the information is online. Um, and if you have any questions, if we have a minute or two, I would, I would take a, a, you know, some questions, so if anybody has them. Thank you. Except for someone special, and we Ooh. really want to give you this award. Color thank coordinated you so with your outfit. Oh, thank you very and, much. And our logo. But I think everyone now knows why we're giving you this award. Oh, that the you. model of what you and Peter have done together for this field in a kind of under the radar but very big and important way is so influential and so consonant with our goals and what we're trying to do, and you've done it. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Really yes. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Questions? Yeah, any questions?
Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, your candor is wonderful, and it's something that all of us who are on the other side never really get to see un unless we're very closely involved. I would I see your reasons for choosing to go with the expert organizations and advisory board. But the experience of several organizations has been that self-nomination will bring more women candidates because otherwise it's the same old guys whose names have been coming up. And I was wondering why you had decided and whether you would reconsider the possibility of looking at self-nomination and still using your experts then to do your filtering. Um, we, I guess, I mean, it's a very good question. Um, the kinds of self-nominations we've have we've had have been really hilarious. Um, the the most hilarious was um, a large box about this big that arrived from Taiwan um, with a person who had I can't really remember all the things, but among them he had been an astrologer and so forth. And really the idea was that he would like to get any award we would be able to give and he was a wonderful citizen and so forth. Um, we had the experience of a person nominating themselves and thinking that it was a popularity contest. So um, our website was deluged with more than 200 supporting letters um, and really not, I mean these are really for groundbreaking, paradigm shifting breakthroughs of which I mean, it's not your everyday person. Um, I think you have an excellent point. I mean, one of the benefits we've seen with women chairs is that sometimes women, um, I mean, this, we gave, we gave a, a chair of neuroscience at Brandeis, for example, and part of the reason is because they have more women heads of, of all the STEM areas, really, and it's, it's fabulous. And what is, what is the result of that? Well, when you, when you hear it, they have lunch together. And so it's networking, but it's not just networking. It's like, oh, you're doing what with your microscope? Um, oh, we're, we're running, we're using a different method. You're, you're what? Oh, can I come over and see? And it's a really, not just interdisciplinary exchange, which is, which is happening, but there's, there's a real different level of excitement and collaboration um, that happens, you know, as a result. I think um, women are able to advocate for women and describe um, often to promote um, underappreciated research. Uh, we've seen that happen in our committees. Um, but at the highest levels, we, I mean, I think it opens the door to so much work on the part of staff, mm -hmm. so much filtering out of extraneous and undesirable and unqualified types of nominations. Part of the, part of the reasons that, if, if, I mean, our, our format is we accept nominations. And for example, in neuroscience, we might get 60 nominations in a year. So you can't deal with 60 nominations. So in January, we have a call. The purpose of the call is to narrow the field. So out of 60 people, these people are doing great research, not quite at the top. These people are doing terrific research, maybe in a few years at the top, mm -hmm. promising, not groundbreaking. We're down to 12 people, really good top contenders. Then those 12 in the first day of the two-day deliberations of neuroscience, they get down to five, and then five hotly contended, you know, really primary people. So if somebody is wanting to nominate themselves, all they have to do is to ask their department chair or any other champion around them or any other colleagues to work with them to create that nomination. And that is totally acceptable. So I think that's a good way to go. Um, but for us, we've just had so much other experience with the self-nomination process that, um, yeah, Thank you. that's a good question. Thank you. May a tiny staff, that's it. <laughs> I went to their offices in New York, and you would be amazed at the volume of work that this little thing puts together. And so I think 
We have a champion of the <laughs> multitasking amazing person is Sarah, who's heading the, the Gruber Foundation at Yale. And we've always had a small staff. We've had two or three people usually. So yeah, lean, yeah, very lean. Thank you very much. Yes, yes.